Hello and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Borman. The Bloomington City Council met on Wednesday, August 21st. Council members deliberated on a resolution that would approve the insurance of refunding bonds in an amount up to $30 million to refinance 2015 tax increment financing revenue bonds. Deputy City Clerk Jennifer Crossley walked through the resolution. Resolution 2024-16, approving the issuance of refunding bonds of the City of Bloomington Redevelopment District. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution authorizes the issuance of tax increment revenue refunding bonds by the City of Bloomington Redevelopment Commission and a maximum principal amount of $30 million for the purpose of the refunding of all outstanding City of Bloomington, Indiana Redevelopment District Tax increment revenue bonds of 2015 to achieve net present value debt service savings due to lower interest rates. City Attorney Larry Allen expanded on the legislation, saying that the issuance of bonds could save the Redevelopment Commission a significant amount of money. Uh, This is legislation that would authorize the issuance and the refinance of existing bonds that are given by the Redevelopment Commission. In 2015, as part of the consolidation of various TIF districts in the city, uh, bonds were issued against those TIF districts. Uh, The earliest that those bonds could be refunded is February of next year. Uh, The interest rate uh, um, environment is significantly better at this time, and we estimate that we could uh, have a significant savings. City Controller Jessica McClellan said that the 2015 tax increment revenue bonds helped pay for the construction of Switchyard Park and the development of the Trades District, among other city projects. Jessica McClellan, City Controller. And the 20, uh, like I was saying, the 2015 TIF bond, 80% was used to build Switchyard Park. The other projects um, from that bond that came out of that bond, activating and developing the Trades District, renovating and expanding the Animal Shelter, and part of the large 17th Street project, including the multi-use path. Um, Most of the 17th Street project expenses are labeled multi-use path for this TIF bond. So huge projects. Um, There are other various smaller things in there like the Allison Jukebox Center got an ADA renovation. Um, The city purchased the land where night moves used to be which is now going to be affordable housing. Um, We were part of that deal so those are the main uses that it was spent on. Council member Matt Flaherty added a final comment before voting on the resolution saying that he's looking for more clarity on the policy. I'd like to better understand uh, the the downsides of collecting TIF revenue for as long as possible, um, formerly in perpetuity, then 30 years, now 25 with a you know gap before the start time, uh, because that's not necessarily always justified or, or needed on the basis of the investment that was made, it sounds like, but it's just possible, so we do it. Um, there are benefits to that, some of which were noted, but I think there are potential downsides too, um, in terms, of, especially to the other taxing units, in, including the city's own general fund. Um, although, of course, we're just a portion of. Uh, when, when you look at all the other taxing units, we're a portion of any any uh, chunk of money. Uh, so I just wanted to voice those questions and concerns I have that have at least talked to our, our RDC um, uh, appointments about, uh, and had some initial conversations and, and <laughs> doing some thinking about, but. Again, I, I, I'm wading quickly out of my depth in, in this area and, and definitely need to talk to the experts, I think, to understand more deeply. Council member Dave Rollo said he wants to make sure the city's capital investments are equally distributed. When we decided to consolidate the respective TIFs into a single unit, um, it was for specific purposes in mind that were spoken about by the controller. But it makes me wonder about whether taxes that were accrued in the various areas have been e- equally distributed in terms of their investment and whether you know, certain areas have gone lacking because um, we've been concentrating on certain capital investments and not others that you know, we have competing ones. And it would be nice to have a discussion about that and, and, and have a visual to think about this in the future. The council voted 7-0 to zero in support of the resolution.
The Bloomington City Council will hold departmental budget hearings through the upcoming week and will resume its regular session on September 4th. The Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees met on August 21st. Director Greer Carson gave his monthly report on the library. July saw an uptick in most of our patron visit circulation and program attendance numbers. That's not too surprising given that it was the height of summer reading and we have an extensive catalog of programs, but it is worth noting. Similarly, our overall collection use is up for the third straight month. Again, summer reading has a lot to do with this, particularly with regard to physical item circulation, but our digital co uh, collection use has remained steady since April and saw a notable increase in July. Our Ellettsville programs have been very popular with a pair of programs uh, drawing far more attendees than expected. And the teen space saw an unusually high number of uh, patrons for the summer months. Normally we see a little bit of a lull, so that was great. During a recent power outage, our staff here downtown did a fabulous job improvising and arranged movie screenings for patrons who were in here sheltering from the storm. So thanks to children's librarian Reagan Zelaya in particular for putting this together. We have had such a strong show of support for our Southwest Branch reopening. Patrons share their joy and appreciation on a daily basis. And once again, we thank them and everyone in the community for their patience and understanding uh, as we work through this challenging time. We are still closing out some purchase orders with insurance for replacement furniture and some remaining punch list items related to floor and or electrical fixes. And so we're still awaiting that final subrogation report, which can't come until we're done closing out all of those purchase orders. Board President Chris Harrison asked Carson about the work he'd been doing to change Indiana Code's definition of what a library is. Carson responded. The, the biggest goal of the group so far has been to make sure that the diversity of programs and services that public libraries offer in the 21st century is somehow um, captured in the language that exists in the Indiana Code. Right now, it really talks about books and collection development, uh, reference assistance and reader's advisory, you know, sort of the traditional pieces of public library services, um, but it doesn't accurately reflect everything that libraries do or could do. And of course, we are more of a third space now. Our service model is quite flexible, and by us, I mean all public libraries. Um, so when legislators talk about making changes to the way library budgets are overseen and approved, it's very important that the Indiana Code accurately describes what public libraries do today versus what they did 30 or 40 years ago. And so we're working together to draft some proposed language changes just to have in case we want to take it to the state legislature and kind of lobby for adopting some of those changes next year or the year after. And a lot of that depends on what happens in the state legislature. Later in the meeting, Content Development Manager Lisa Ciampelli presented on the adjustments the staff has made to the Collection Development Policy and asked for the Board's approval of the changes. So the Collection Development Policy uh, serves to help inform our community and our staff about some of the guiding principles and criteria that we consider when we're adding materials to the collection. Uh, because libraries, communities, and our collections are evolving on a continual basis, uh, we aim to review this annually and make any uh, updates accordingly. We did do a comprehensive review of the collection devel development policy last year um, uh, with input from other departments, um, and this was done in conjunction with updating our procedures for how we handle requests for reconsideration. Uh, so we didn't do uh, any kind of major uh, uh, review and, and update comprehensively again this year, but members of the content development department did have some suggestions for edits and revisions, and we brought those to Greer and our leadership team and are bringing to you now for approval. Champelli walked the board through some of the changes and explained the reasoning behind them. The next change, we took out the reference to promotional purposes uh, so that it doesn't seem to contradict um, uh, our, our belief that we don't show approval or disapproval for particular materials. We certainly make recommendations. We uh, promote discovery of materials uh, or, or specific titles through book lists, but we're not, you know, promoting uh, a particular, you know, this is best, uh, you know, ab above others kind of thing. So that, that was the reasoning for taking that out. Another edit she suggested was reinstating the idea that they will focus on purchasing content that is getting a lot of attention from the public. 
And then under the section about selection of diverse and inclusive materials, we're recommending moving away from describing our collection as balanced and instead uh, recognizing uh, that we aim to be representational. And this change was really um, kind of advised in part by um, a uh, professor um, of library of science. I can't remember exactly where she teaches now, but her name is Emily Knox, and she's an expert in intellectual freedom issues, and she was a, our keynote speaker at Staff Day uh, uh, last September. And you know, she just kind of pointed out that Libraries aren't doing a one-for-one one kind of, you know, a balance of I have this subject, I'm going to have that one, or I've got this viewpoint, I'm going to have the opposing viewpoint. It's really meant to be representational. You know, are we providing different perspectives, different voices, um, and, and not, you know, having it be a one-for-one one kind of thing. Under selection criteria, uh, we're seeking just to kind of correct a combining of criteria bullet, bullet points that we made last year, uh, which inadvertently replaced uh, attention from critical media reviewers with recommendations. And we want to reinstate attention. Um, and while we're always looking you know, to get the best of the best for our community and, and looking for those good positive recommendations of materials, a lot of time we're going to purchase things because it's, it's getting a lot of notoriety and it's what people want. They want to be part of the conversation about what is everybody else talking about. This is getting a lot of attention. I want to learn about it too. Um, so that, that's the reason for that change. Board member Nichelle Wash asked for clarification on what it would entail for media to be considered relevant. Champelli responded. I think it's just to, to help um, explain that a selector, if they're presented with a request to buy something or a suggestion, um, you know, that presents a need, uh, but they're having to weigh, well, how does this title, how does it relate to our collection development policy? How does it relate to um, what others have been asking for? How does it relate to what we may already have in the collection that, that provides representation on this topic? The board voted to approve the updated collection development policy unanimously. The next meeting of the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees will be held on September 18th. At the Monroe County Plan Commission meeting on August 20th, the Commission heard a rezone request for a historic preservation overlay on a property located at 6056 East State Road 46. Senior Planner Drew Myers presented on the request. The petitioner is requesting to rezone the site to add it to the Historic Preservation Overlay District, um, which is um, defined in the zoning ordinance. The most recent Indiana Historic Sites and Structures Inventory, or IHSSI County Survey for Monroe County is available via the State Historic Architectural and Archaeological Research Database, also known as SHARD, which indicates that the property is rated as contributing. A C or contributing rating is given to any properties meeting the basic inventory criterion of being pre-1940, but that are not important enough to stand on their own as individually outstanding or notable. Such resources are important to the density or continuity of the area's historic fabric. Contributing properties can be listed in the National Register of Historic Places if they are part of an, an historic district, but do not usually qualify individually. Um, this property did not appear in the Monroe County Interim Report of 1989. Um, the Monroe County, excuse me, the Historic Preservation Overlay uh, does not negate the underlying zoning district, which is suburban residential and properties within the HP overlay are subject to the regulations of both the zoning district and the HP overlay itself. If there is a conflict between these two requirements of zoning districts, uh, the requirements of the historic, uh, being that the zoning district and the historic uh, overlay district, the more restrictive requirements apply. It is important to note that the HP overlay regulations are concerned with exterior uh, appearance and preservation of historic features and not with other zoning or land use requirements. So this was heard by the Historic Preservation Board of Review a number of times, and the ultimate decision was to forward this to, to, with a positive recommendation to this body. Um, and they cited um, two of the criteria that are from Chapter 810-3, which are on the screen now. Number one being an association with events that have made a significant contrib contribution to the broad patterns of county history. And number three, the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction. 
Myers gave the commission some history of the property, saying that it was a bed and breakfast back in 2000. The property was originally operated as a bed and breakfast called Southern Comfort Bed and Breakfast, and that started in 2000. Uh, the, property own, the new property owners that are the petitioners for this case uh, do not have any interest in pursuing the uh, bed and breakfast use on the property. Um, they are going to maintain it as a single family residence. Um, with the help of uh, many different entities that are involved with historic uh, research and historic preservation, the, the petitioners were able to provide a lot of information about the site, um, starting with that the original owner was William Greg Allen, who served in Company 1 of the 38th Indiana Veteran Volunteer Inventory, excuse me, Infantry, during the American Civil War. Uh, the petitioner also provided tax records, photos, and newspaper articles detailing the method of construction of the existing residence and its ties to Arbutus Hill due to its proximity of the area known for the Arbutus flowers presence or trailing Arbutus. Um, as I stated, uh, the property did operate as a Southern Comfort bed and breakfast. That was in the year 2000. Um, and also there is evidence of the property exhibiting uh, architectural characteristics akin to the central passage slash hall and parlor type architecture. Um, and that was popular um, in the southern states um, and it was around in the 18, late 1800s. Myers said that the home meets architectural and historical criteria. The petitioners Creighton and Shannon Thomas were in attendance online. Creighton shared how they came to recognize that the house has historic value. We bought the house because we just loved the house and not really knowing anything much about, you know, history of the home or who owned it and just just kind of one kind of foot in front of the other. We just start to discover things about the house that we think was unique and interesting and it just took us down this road to where we are uh, today and uh, it's just it's just been uh, a lot of fun and interesting and we just really think that the house and the property and the story has just a lot of value uh, for the Monroe County. Commission member Cheryl Munson thanked the petitioners for taking the initiative to preserve their historic property. I was on the Historic Preservation Board for hmm, 10 years and hmm. uh, we don't have lots of uh, properties that have been brought forward by the owners. And I think you set a great example for others and I hope, I hope your efforts will inspire others to bring forth their historic properties. The board voted to approve the historic preservation overlay unanimously. The second request that they heard was for a boat storage planned unit development at 8370 South State Road 46. Myers shared that the parcel of land is currently zoned Forest Reserve. He also shared background information on the petitioner's goal that the PUD allow them to build boat storage, residential homes, and an office. The petitioner is requesting to establish a planned unit development on the subject property. Um, the intent behind establishing the planned unit development is to operate the property under a mixed set of uses, including boat storage, residential, and office. If the planned unit outline plan is approved by the county commissioners, the petitioner will be directed to submit a planned unit development plan. Meyer shared that the drainage board was concerned about the potential for erosion and that staff members do not recommend the approval of the PUD request. The petitioner could petition for a rezone to the limited business zone to acquire the use of boat storage on the northern 4.0 acre parcel without the need for a PUD. The proposal for area B does not align with the terms of the subdivision control ordinance and the petitioner did not include language in the PUD outline plan that would otherwise deviate from those requirements of the subdivision control ordinance for a sliding scale or minor subdivision procedure. The petitioner could perform a by right subdivision through the sliding scale subdivision procedure on the southern 11.3 acre parcel without the need for a PUD. I will now take any questions. Commission member Margaret Clements said that she was in support of the request and that she thought the PUD was an intelligent approach to a complex property. I uh, find it to be um, ecologically remediative you know, re, re, if that's a word. And uh, I find it to be responsible in terms of your stewardship of the forest reserve uh, classification. 
I find that the um, intensity of, of your request would be lower than that would, which would be permitted uh, by right. And so I am intending to vote in favor of this unless I'm persuaded else by, by my colleagues. If I'm wrong in some way, I w my tendency would be to vote for this with, uh, with appreciation, frankly. The commission voted to deny the request for a waiver for a final hearing. They will hear the request again at the next planned commission meeting on September 26. At the Richland Bean Blossom School Board meeting on August 19th, the board held a public hearing on the 2024 General Obligation Bond Project. Superintendent Jerry Sanders explained what the GO bond funds would be used for. The main scope of uh, using these funds would be going towards uh, technology improvements, replacements, and upgrades. Uh, uh, RBB provides our students uh, with Chromebooks. Uh, grades uh, 6 through 12 take those Chromebooks home, and uh, so uh, a good portion of these funds will go towards uh, replacing student Chromebooks. Uh, also, uh, laptops, we provide laptops to our teachers, and uh, 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 as you know, technology is ever-changing, and uh, so we have to constantly be uh, making sure that our uh, equipment, our Chromebooks, our laptops, uh, and our servers, that uh, they uh, are um, still uh, in line with uh, the changing in technology, the changes with the different uh, software programs. Uh, and so, um, that would be the majority uh, of the GEO bonds. We would still have uh, budgeted for just uh, general uh, improvements and renovations uh, in all of our school facilities. Next, financial advisor Matt Shoemaker spoke on the bond and what that would look like for the taxpayer. This is got where you guys currently stand as of today. Again, as a reminder, those two different uh, funds that go into your total tax rate, you have the debt service fund and the operations fund. Uh, the existing debt service, uh, all of your bonds outstanding as of today, illustrated in the Navy portion of this bar graph. Uh, the operations fund tax rate is illustrated by the lighter blue portion of this bar graph. As a reminder, current budget year, you guys are at $1.05 uh, for your tax rate, which has gone down the last couple years. Uh, moving forward, uh, you can see you're set up to have a, a drop moving forward. That sets up the position that you're in today that you can do additional projects. You can do it in a way that meets your tax rate goals. As we look at the next page, uh, you have stated that you would like to drop the tax rate another penny in 2025. Uh, so this page looks at a uh, repayment schedule for the 2024 bonds, the proposed bonds at $3.5 million. Uh, the orange portion in 2025 uh, would take that tax rate to $1.04, so dropping from $1.05 to $1.04 in 2025. Uh, this will be a two-year repayment. You can see there's a little bit out there in 2026, but in 26, as we talked about last time, you retain the flexibility to be able to do additional projects um, as early as next year if you have some, um, and hopefully do so uh, continuing your, uh, your tax rate goal. Later in the meeting, Sanders asked the board to approve a Regional Opportunity Initiatives grant agreement for a career coach. Sanders said he was excited about their model to help students grow from learners to earners. We're one of several counties uh, that partners with ROI and, and the whole basis of the program is to uh, connect uh, education with uh, the business world to be able to, uh, with that partnership, uh, add to the, the community, uh, the economy in, in that community. And uh, so this is just another extension of that, uh, which also aligns with uh, the new uh, uh, diploma plan that uh, DOE is presenting. Uh, this will actually uh, put us out in front. We'll, we'll have opportunities to uh, work with the, the, through this process, be able to work uh, uh, with uh, the, the transition to this new diploma and the, the emphasis on careers. Uh, I like what it says. Uh, 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 the initiative is gonna be 
uh, focusing on the model of learners to earners, learners to earners, I think that's an awesome phrase, um, that uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, work, uh, uh, participate in events that will help us uh, to prepare for our, our eighth graders who will be uh, transitioning to the new diploma. Uh, and, and also the, the career coach. Coach will, will work with our counselors uh, as we make that transition. Uh, we'll work with uh, local uh, employers uh, and just help the whole process uh, get off to a successful start. Uh, this grant uh, ends or expires uh, December 2025. Uh, so it, the position is one that we hope uh, ROI will continue to get additional uh, funding from the Indiana Commission for Higher Education uh, that will uh, fund this position past December of 2025. But uh, the, the bottom line is uh, this position, the career coach, will help us get off to a great start, an informed start uh, to the new diploma plan. The board voted unanimously to approve the grant for a career coach. The next Richland Bean Blossom School Board meeting will be held on September 16th. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman. Thank <laughs> you. 